everybody who is attending. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, we know we have a lot of attendees from all over the world and throughout the United States, and we thank you for joining us today. This is part two of a two-part webinar series. Part one was earlier this week. Um, and in that um, part one, we dealt with preparation for mediation in the patent and technology case. Today, we're calling this Reinventing Your Advocacy Skills for a New Use. And I am joined today by David Allgaier, Janet Martinez, and Rod Thompson. Um, we are, uh, our bios should have been with the registration materials, so you'll have more information about us. Um, but I'll tell you, to give you a little bit of a background, um, David and Rod and I um, spent our legal careers litigating patent and technology cases. And in parallel, we were also serving as arbitrator and mediators in those cases. Uh, about 11 years ago, I went off um, on my own and focused my practice in mediation and arbitration in patent and technology cases, among other things. And uh, David has been also uh, focusing his practice in the area um, for some time now. And Rod, at the end of this month, will be starting a new practice focusing solely on um, mediation and arbitration. Um, we are, the three of us are also on the tech list of the Silicon Valley Arbitration and Mediation Center. Um, so check that out um, online. Uh, it is a, um, the tech list is um, populated with other folks like ourselves that have extensive mediation and arbitration experience and technology backgrounds. Uh, we are also joined today by Janet Martinez, um, who is currently the director of the Gould Negotiation and Mediation Program at Stanford Law School. Uh, Janet has extensive experience as a mediator. She has also trained mediators. And um, at Stanford, she also uh, uh, teaches ADR courses, including mediation. So today we're trying to make it as interactive as possible. We have some polling questions that'll pop up um, that should get you involved. And those polling questions are based upon a, um, a factual scenario that you should have gotten when you registered or last Friday, I think a lot of people um, received it. And um, we also have, um, please feel free in the question and answer um, function that you have to send us um, questions. We will probably get to most of them um, at the end of the, um, of the presentation today. We left some time. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? We're going to cover mistakes to avoid. We're going to talk about what it's all about. Initial joint session, early later and later caucuses, overcoming obstacles, documenting the settlement, enforcing the mediated settlement, and a little bit about international commercial mediation. And so with that, I'm going to turn things over to David Allgaier. All right. Thank you, Harry. Uh, oddly enough, we're going to start this by telling you what not to do. And hopefully, by the time we're done, uh, you also will have an idea of at least what we think you should do. Uh, but these are 10 mistakes to avoid. I won't go over all of them but a few I will highlight, and uh, we'll be addressing a number of these uh, items during our time with you here today. Uh, obviously, our entire last presentation was about preparation, so yeah, you shouldn't skip that, uh, and we spent a lot of time on that. Let me highlight this notion of misunderstanding roles. It's important to realize that while you have the same people pretty much involved in a mediation as you have in litigation or in a court proceeding, the roles are all different. Uh, and we'll be talking about that. And it's important to understand that. The mediator is not a judge. Uh, the advocate is not just an advocate. Uh, the client is not just a testifying witness. All those roles are a little bit different. It's important that uh, you prepare for your mediation with that in mind. Uh, another thing that's Im important, it seems to me, is uh, this whole notion of insulting or offending. Uh, remember, and this is a theme you'll see throughout, that what you're trying to do at a mediation is get your opponent to understand your position and at least give it some credit 
uh, so they can work with you uh, to come to a solution that everyone can live with. Uh, but we'll get into more of all that later. I uh, just wanted to presage that. Uh, this is a helpful slide before you do your next mediation to look at these 10 things and see whether you're going to do any of them and then don't. And that will also help you prepare, it seems to me. Uh, with that, let's go to our first uh, polling question. Jan? Jan, is on, Jan you're on mute, mute. There we go. Beg your pardon. Uh, so picking up from David, what to avoid, uh, want to reframe this and what we want to uh, highlight in terms of the skills. So who bears responsibility for the mediation process? Uh, the mediation advocates, the mediator, the client, all of the above. So please select your button and submit and we'll see what kind of results we got here. So we have, we, uh, we are all of the above and indeed uh, you're prompted correctly uh, to think about what are all the different roles and responsibilities of the mediator, the mediation advocates, the clients, and in this case, all bear responsibility for making the process of mediation function and uh, to advantage. So let's look at categorizing some of the skills that each uh, of us takes on. The role of the mediation advocate, counsel for the clients, of which there are at least two and maybe more, depending on the number of parties in the case, uh, is really both a, a combination of responsibility for the substance, uh, such as championing the client's interests, uh, being an objective analyst about what what the case is about in terms of the facts and the law and how that comes together. But there are a lot of responsibilities for skill in the process management piece. So really the lawyer representing their client uh, needs a big picture view uh, as the process architect. Who is, uh, who's on first um, and what their responsibilities are. So in terms of uh, the voice of reason of the tone that is used both with your client and with the other side, thinking about your abilities as a negotiator and how do you present your interests, how do you listen, acknowledge the other parties, uh, and then find ways to creatively problem solve the issues before you. Uh, of help to the mediator. This is a reciprocal relationship really between counsel and the mediator. The uh, counsel wants to be helpful to the mediator so they can do their job to facilitate agreement, but also the mediator is going to be supportive of counsel so that counsel can be most effective with their client. Uh, picking up drafting, of course, at the end of the day is really converting that process into a product. So, I'm going to uh, move on to Rod and who's going to pick up on how the sessions function and how those uh, process and substance skills play out. Thank you, Jan. So now we're going to turn to the actual mediation session. We've been building up to this for part one and mm -hmm. earlier today. So what happens at the mediation session, which has been in person, but can now be by Zoom, but it's when everyone gets together and conducts the session. A first question is whether there'll be an initial joint session. And by joint session, I think we all know that means everyone together, uh, all participants, lawyers, clients, and the mediator. Um, it used to be that that was the default. Every time you go to a mediation, you would expect a joint session to start the mediation. And that was just the way things were done. Um, now there is more flexibility. Mediation has always been flexible, but now some people and some mediators just dispense with the joint session. So depending on your mediator and maybe even depending on the area of the country you're in or the area of the world you're in, you may walk into a mediation 
and be ushered into a private caucus without a joint session. I think it's still probably more common to have some joint session, but you need to figure this out and you need to know in advance. We talk about preparation, we'll say it again. You don't just walk into a mediation session without knowing if there'll be a joint session. You need to know that, you need to prepare your client, you need to prepare for what you're gonna say if there is a joint session and how you're gonna handle it. And joint sessions can range from merely introductions, kind of just formalities, hello, how are you, and the mediator introducing him or herself and going through ground rules to real substantive presentations by both sides. And even sometimes you can have expert witnesses providing more or less testimony. So you can have anywhere among that uh, range of options for your initial joint session. And joint sessions don't have to start the mediation session. Joint sessions can occur anytime during the mediation. I think on our last um, part one, Jan mentioned a, or I think it was actually Harry mentioned a situation she had as a mediator where she had to reconvene back to a joint session because there was a issue about damages and she wanted the parties to talk to each other about the facts to make sure there was no misunderstanding about the damages and units in question. That kind of thing can happen quite a lot with mediators. Mediators want to make sure they get the facts accurate. And you, sometimes if you're going back and forth to caucuses, you want to make sure nothing's lost in translation. Another example of a later caucus or later joint session I had in the last year was when we um, went through a full day mediation and reached an impasse. The parties were just not very close uh, to reach an agreement on your underlying dispute. But we had an interesting um, CEO there, a CEO for one of the divisions of one of the parties said, I would like to meet with my counterpart and I'd like to do it with just a mediator and talk about other possible resolutions. We did that. We met with the two CEOs and a whiteboard and within an hour or so they had mapped out a bunch of other deals that had nothing to do with the original controversy, but they found places to work with and they ended up resolving the case. So joint sessions can occur at any time. They can be with everyone. They can be with only the principals as I experienced. They can be only with counsel. You can really have any, uh, any number of different uh, versions of that. But the takeaway for this is plan in advance. Make sure that your client is aware of what's gonna happen. Um, and has buy-in, so everyone's on the same page. Next slide, please. Now, the, the traditional joint, initial joint, sorry, initial joint session starts off with an opening statement. And I say it's traditional because as I've already explained, opening statements are not required. Either side can choose not to present one, but if you do present one, you need to think about it very carefully. What is it that you want to accomplish with your joint with your opening statement. And at the bottom of the slide, we make clear, remember this is not court. You're not there to persuade a judge or jury. You don't wanna insult anyone. You ultimately have to persuade the other side of the table that they should reach a resolution with you. So you don't wanna alienate them and you certainly don't want to insult them. You're not gonna win at this stage. Um, so think about who will be present on the other side. Who are you really trying to convince? Is it the lawyer? Probably not. You probably want to convince the decision maker on the other side. And how will you do that? Do you want to do that by legal arguments, by factual arguments, by just plain persuasion? Um, think it through and be able to listen to the other side. Part of the advantage of an opening statement is you're getting information. And if you can hear the other side's opening statement, and if you can get their uh, expression of what their real needs and interests are, that can be very helpful later in the day when you're trying to fashion common ground and trying to facilitate a resolution. So speak to the other side politely and practice, always practice. That's how you are effective at anything um, and you should be ready for this. Also make sure your client is aware. If your client is gonna be surprised at the tone um, and substance of your opening statement, you haven't briefed them well. You need to get the client's buy-in and make sure your client understands maybe why you're more reasonable than they expect, maybe why you're not pounding your chest more. And that's because you're always thinking of the end result. I think that would then set us up for a polling question. Um, and I'm gonna 
read this one carefully. From what you know about this dispute with respect to the prospect of either or both PL and DEFCO is presenting an opening statement. If there is a joint session, which of the following best summarizes your opinion? A, PL should seize the opportunity to speak directly to the client decision makers at DEFCO as they should be persuaded by PL's more persuasive arguments on the merits. For DEFCO, B, for DEFCO to present an opening would most likely be ineffective and perhaps even counterproductive given that PL has made up its mind. C, listening to the unvarnished views of PL directly could provide a better understanding for DEFCO of its opponent's underlying interests. D is A and C and E is none of the above. So please do um, vote. And while we're doing that, I wanna mention something on the beginning of this question. Recognize it would be the prospect of either DEFCO or PL presenting an opening statement. They don't both have to do it. You can have one side deciding to present an opening statement and the other side not. So that's, that's another option. I'd say it's unusual. Typically, if one side wants to do it, the other side will as well. But again, mediation is flexible and you can really tailor it to whatever meets the needs of the disputes. Okay, so here we have the results. 77% go with A and C and 16% with A or with C, sorry. Interesting, no one took just A or just B and you have 7% none of the above. I myself would have maybe chosen C because I think that best captures a goal for mediation where you're listening to the unvarnished views of the other side in order to understand the opponent's underlying interests. You're not trying to understand legal arguments, but you're trying to get interests. Whereas A is more of a argumentative thing. That is A and C together, A suggests that PL should seize the opportunity to persuade DL or DEFCO on the merits. That would be unusual. It's certainly a possibility, but that's like trying to win at trial as opposed to, or win with your legal arguments as opposed to looking for underlying interests. Next slide, please. Okay, here we have a slide where I'm not gonna go through all of this, but this is an example of if you did choose to do an opening statement, here's some of the approaches you might wanna take. And again, there's no one size fits all, but certainly you do want to acknowledge your opponent's underlying interests and needs. You wanna provide clarifications on your own interests and needs if you can. You want to have your opponent see your client's perspective, from your client's perspective. You want to have your opponent come to, into your shoes of your client if you possibly can. And of course, consider visual aids. You might want to have a PowerPoint. You might want to have powerful documents. Um, one point here on opening statements is you may want to play a few cards. You may want to give your opponent more information than they have right now, especially if it's persuading them to be more reasonable from your point of view, but you also may wanna hold some cards back. You don't have to play everything. And there is a, um, a risk that you're providing free discovery. So you wanna be careful. Now the last um, few bullet points here, get into our fact scenario and just to play that out. You know, if, you're, if you have a patent case and you're the uh, patentee, you probably wanna have a claim chart. You probably wanna lay out, here are the elements of the claims we're asserting, and here's why we think we have a strong case. Or in this case, you may well, well wanna talk about the data flow defense and explain you get it, you understand why the other side is raising that, but actually it's not that strong a defense and here's why. So you give legitimacy to their arguments and then you explain why you think politely they're wrong. In short, with joint sessions, they don't have to have it happen. They might happen at any time, but if they do happen, be ready and be prepared. Ready for the next slide. Okay, we have a polling question that's 
one of mine, and this focuses on early caucuses. During early caucuses, DEFCO's representative and counsel should A, ensure that the mediator understands all of the intricacies of, quote, data flow computing, close quote, and the software code. B, ensure the mediator fully understand DEFCO's case and the factors and interests important to DEFCO in settlement. C, be prepared to make a counterproposal, of course, if there was an outstanding proposal. D, communicate frustrations and concerns. E, all of the above. So let's see, there's a little bit of a curveball here. Let's see if, <clears throat> where we come out. And this is for early caucuses. And I'm gonna go through the issues regarding early caucuses in a minute. Okay, so we have 25% say ensure the mediator fully understand the DEFCO's case and the factors. Okay, that's, that's good. I, that's my vote also. All of the above was a little bit of the curveball and certainly um, I would say B, C and D also are important. So let's go to, I'll explain the curveball in a minute. <clears throat> in early caucuses, um, just a couple of things, and again, we're focusing on patent and technology cases. One of the things that I hear uh, oftentimes from folks, um, patent litigators, advocates are, they don't like the touchy-feely stuff in the mediation. Let's just focus on the merits. And the issue with that is my experience, um, I've been mediating for 20 years as a mediator, is that the emotional part or the non-merits part, I'll call it that, uh, sometimes it's the most important issues to have to deal with. And it could be trust issues, it could be anger, frustration. Again, it depends upon what the, situ what the dispute is about. Is it simply a patent infringement suit where the parties didn't know one another before? Um, that certainly presents its own issues, but then uh, emotional issues. Or is it where parties were working together and they had a very valuable agreement and they're divorcing, or in some cases, they want to stay together. So I would say that emotional vetting, if there are issues, ought to be raised even before the caucus, but certainly they should be dealt with at the early, in the early caucus. Why? One, so that you get it out on the table and you understand some, there's, there's information to be gotten from that vetting. Um, and also from the client standpoint or even the advocate standpoint, it helps them focus better during the, the, the rest of the mediation. The, the, what I call the, um, uh, the issue, the curveball. if you look at the third um, point on the slide, avoid focus too heavily on the merits. Uh, something to really keep in mind is, I would recommend, and I did this, I said this um, two days ago in part one, that for purposes of understanding all the nuances of the technology, the patent infringement issues, if there are um, certain important contractual issues, um, invalidity, et cetera, um, it's important to try to do a deep dive with the mediator before the mediation. Uh, so that, that can be through the, through the uh, written submissions and that can be through ex parte calls, which are often held before the mediation and after submissions. And the reason why is, is that keep in mind that the medi mediation is not a summary judgment hearing. It's not a Markman hearing. Uh, oftentimes parties may leave just one very, very full day to deal with a lot of very complicated issues. And focusing too much on the merits gets your mind away from all the other issues, the non-merits-based issues that are important, the business issues, the interests the parties had, et cetera. It may involve a global settlement, the, the, the patent and technology cases. And so you need to think about that too. Now, how do you balance that? Do you say, well, on the early caucus, you don't say anything about the merits? And that would be, if you look at the, this was in the polling question and it's a penultimate um, point on the slide, 
it, it, it is good to have a common understanding. So there you are in the caucus room with the mediator, the party representatives, and the advocate uh, that were outside counsel. It's good to be able to say, here's what the case is about overall, kind of summarize. This is the case, this is what we see are the strengths and weaknesses, not getting into the weeds of the merits at that point in time. Um, and then talking about for sure, even having the client representative talk about his or her, the interests that, he, that they are dealing with involving the dispute. So that's that balance there of how much and why. The other thing I'll mention just very quickly is be prepared with a proposal or to make a counter proposal. Um, try to avoid standing on ceremonies. Uh, in, in many of these cases, there may have been and probably were prior settlement negotiations that, that failed. It may have been just because the parties decided to go that route. It could have been contractually, there was a step up clause and so the parties tried to get together and were not able to, to do so. Um, but oftentimes mediators will try to push the parties to have a counter proposal or proposal ready. And the other important thing about doing this in the early caucus, and we're gonna to get to this later when we talk about the enforcement of mediated settlements, it's because if you have an idea in your mind, a proposal or counter proposal, to identify what are the essential elements of a, of a settlement, what do you believe? And oftentimes what I like to do in the early caucus stages is to try to get from the parties, get them on the same page with regard to what are essential terms. They may not have agreement on what they are, but identifying them is, is certainly important progress. Now, what about later caucuses? Um, the reality testing is, is something that usually comes into play later on because as you're trying to put more meat on the bones and trying to establish more of the settlement, uh, it's possible that people need to be able to understand, do a litigation risk analysis and be able to understand what their risks are. And so the deep dive that, that an advocate and a mediator and maybe with their client have done before the mediation leading up um, can be very useful now. I would say that uh, Rod mentioned, consider the use of joint sessions aimed at specific objectives. I won't repeat that here because he did a very good job of it just a couple minutes ago, but those can be very important if they, particularly when they have a purpose, and Rod gave some examples of purposes that come up in, in patent technology cases. Um, the other thing I'll point out is BATNA. And this is, I, I had an example that I, I wanted to share with you, and, and it comes up a lot with people not having a realistic best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So that when they have a proposal come across the table or proposals going back and forth, as opposed to working harder to making sure that their interests are reflected in the proposal that goes back and that they can reflect what they know of the other side's interests in the proposal, working harder, their default may be, I'm just going to walk away. Um, or I can just, in a patent infringement case, I can just take, um, I, I had a situation where um, they, the defendant was selling widgets and there were, the patent covered a lot of bells and whistles. He said, I can just take the bells and whistles off. And when we went through and we said, well, you're importing the, the widget into the United States and there's a tax on it with the bells and whistles that you're paying. And then you're going to set up shop to take the bells and whistles <laughs> off when you get into the United States. And then is there a market for the widget without the bells and whistles? Sure enough, you know, reality started thinking, thinking in. And so in patent and, and technology cases, keep in mind as an advocate that it's important to keep your, um, you can even use a mediator uh, to do this or, or, you know, or at the, the time when there's just um, some downtime, make sure that your client um, is aware of, of the BATNA and how realistic that is. Um, the other thing I'll say just very quickly, because Jan's going to uh, deal with impediments and Rod's going to deal with media's proposal in a couple minutes. Just listen to the points. I think this was made earlier. Rod may have made the point earlier. Listen to the points raised by the mediator and respond to the points. Don't dismiss them. Oftentimes in cases, patent and technology cases, they're very complex, complex relating to legal issues, relating to map parties, could be a global settlement, whatever. 
make sure that you're hearing everything that the, that the mediator is bringing in and digesting everything. Um, and keep in mind that that mediator is going to help you frame, reframe your proposal so that it's considered by the other side. So now we're going to go on to, uh, Jan is going to cover impediments. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Harry. So earlier I talked about the multi-skills multi that a, a mediation advocate requires, both in terms of substance and process. Those skills are not new or different, really. They're a different combination from the skills that a council would use in negotiation, in uh, arbitration, and litigation during settlement. Uh, discussion. So these skills are, are not new, but they just uh, are framed and the tone is, is different um, at certain times during the mediation process. A uh, number of bumps, though, can come up in the road uh, through mediation. And so we wanted to touch on a few of these. If there's a, a different perception of what is true uh, of the facts, just thinking um, and mentioning the opportunity to use a, an independent expert or some uh, neutral source of the facts on which both sides are require, uh, relying. Uh, sometimes one party just doesn't have enough information, could be you, could be the other side. So are there ways to use the mediator or public sources or some court proceeding that is going to get that information available. Sometimes it's related to item four, unpreparedness. So insufficient information and not prepared, a bad combination. The answer to that is almost always no. Um, so thinking about how uh, allow a little more time. If the other side is not balanced in its understanding of the facts in the law, uh, to give them a little more space, to save space, uh, save face and space, uh, to um, be more prepared and be able to engage more effectively. Uh, lack of uh, mediation experience, either on your side or the other side, uh, either one is really needing to uh, allocate enough time for that preparation to walk yourself and your client through the, uh, the caucus process and how that works vis-a-vis uh, -vis ex parte information uh, to the mediator uh, and how the parties uh, connect. Uh, if they're just not ready. So remember on Tuesday, we talked about when do you mediate? And we said anytime, but you're basically balancing, do I know enough to make an informed decision? And if not, then how can the process leverage my capacity to make those choices? Uh, emotion, we have this in big red letters for a good reason, is uh, people still caught in either the clients or the lawyers, uh, caught in the emotion, the anger, frustration, uh, can uh, not hear any rational proposals or ideas from the other side. So as counsel, uh, certainly watching for this, either on your client or on the other side, uh, detect, uh, address in some way, uh, take a break. So you can take a breath, take a break, reset your, your expectations in the tone in the process. It may be that you need to back up a few steps and get to what are the compelling interests or concerns of either your client or the other client, uh, because people will keep uh, uh, emphasizing their frustration if they don't feel heard. So just dealing with the emotion of the moment uh, and giving it uh, acknowledgement and space. Let's see, next slide. I think we have some more barriers. Uh, assumptions. Uh, as lawyers, we make a certain number of assumptions about what is true and assuming that we know the facts and uh, that are given, uh, be really careful about recognizing the assumptions you're making, which if they were true, you go down one path, but what if they weren't true? What if the intentions in the other side were not as evil um, as you're assuming? then how differently might you deal with their proposal or explanation? 
Uh, risk tolerance. The parties can have real differences around risk tolerance uh, among the parties, their values, their principles. And so recognizing that difference, certainly in coming to agreement, sometimes it's the differences that yield the most amount of value because the parties uh, either prioritize interests differently or they have different risk tolerance, they have different time tolerance. So recognize that as a potential uh, aid to your nego negotiation or mediation uh, and not just a problem. So thinking about um, tolerance. Uh, insufficient settlement authority. And if that is clearly not adequate to the proposals on the table, we want to recognize that, take a break, confer with the mediator, uh, and see if they can explore with the other side. Is there some threshold uh, that you've exceeded and need to have a different decision maker or advisor at the table? Um, related to ineffective decision makers, people who don't have authority or don't have a full grasp of the situation and the possibilities. So changing parties, changing decision makers, at that point to the process may make sense. Uh, understanding the historical and personal narratives, uh, that really is, sets the context and the culture for the whole process. And if you don't understand the history that led to this dispute or led to the capacity of the parties to even have a conversation. Uh, consider whether using the mediator, a different decision maker, an adjusted process, a break, any of those that might help. And lastly, uh, thinking about what are the strategic goals and priorities for each of the parties. Overall, what are the two or three critical issues that are essential to any agreement and make sure that the decision makers, uh, one, are willing to take a creative perspective on the possible outcomes, and two, that the right parties are in conversation uh, to do that. All right, now uh, let us uh, move on to David and some more thoughts about uh, how things can go wrong. Well, let's talk about some typical mediation lamentations, we're calling it. Uh, I don't know whether that's the mediator or one of the parties that's depicted there, but that's certainly a, a, a feeling that uh, I've seen in mediations often around three or four o'clock if they started in the morning, you start hearing things like this. Uh, one of them is, look, we've been here all day and all we do is give thing up. We are done. If I had a nickel, uh, every time I heard that as a mediator, I'd have quite a few nickels. Uh, the solution is, um, that's almost never true. I'm sure it feels like that uh, to one of the parties at the mediation and maybe both, uh, but it never really is true. One of the things I've done is I said, well, okay, well, let's go over the history of this. Where did they start? Where did you start? Here are the moves. And yeah, you know, everybody is giving things up, maybe not as much as you think they should, or maybe you think you're giving up too much, but there is movement here, uh, and, and there always is. And uh, that seems to uh, help people understand that the process is moving forward, although kind of slowly. Um, but that's, the, well, that's often the nature of the process. And another thing I often say to people is, okay, I understand you're frustrated, but look, you've already got a lot of time into this today. You've prepared for this, we've spent time on this. Let's just see how low we can get the other side to go. You don't have to take it, but let's just see where that is. Or if, you, you know, if you're talking to the, uh, um, the uh, plaintiff, you're saying, well, let's just see how much money they will pay or what they will do for you, whatever it might be. And uh, let's just proceed that way. We, we may not even need to settle, but let's at least find out how far apart we are and get something out of what we've been doing today. And uh, I'd say, probably, I don't know, three quarters to 80% of the time you keep things going that way, you end up with a settlement. Uh, funny how that works. Um, another one, certainly you're likely to hear is we are simply at the limit of a financial ability. We can't pay anymore. We don't have it. Uh, that may or may not be true. That's a hard thing to examine. 
Uh, I have had situations where people said, well, let's see your financial statements and all that sort of thing, and, and they, they've obliged. But another thing that can happen is phased payments. Um, this, it, nobody wants it that way. Everybody would like to just do a one and done if it, if it involves payment of money. Let's just have it done. But sometimes that's not possible. And then uh, maybe the amount isn't so bad, particularly if it can be over time. And then the negotiation goes to, you know, when and how much, uh, what happens if they don't pay, but it's going in a positive direction uh, to get a case settled. Sometimes uh, one party will have technology the other side wants. It's like, well, they can't pay us, but I've always been interested in this patent they have. I wonder if they'd license that to us or you know, license it for free or help us with that. Or maybe they have uh, some um, distribution channels that are inter interesting to the other party. Maybe you can explore that. Anyway. The point being, there are ways around those things. You have to look for value, not just in payment of money, uh, but in other values that's possible. That's the beauty of mediation, is you can find things uh, that a court could never find that can bring the parties together. Um, another one is, and I mentioned this last time, is one party says, uh, the, say the plaintiff in a patent case, we don't believe they haven't sold as much as they say. They haven't sold any of these. I'm sure that's not true. They're a market leader. And the solution to that is going to be more information. Just You can provide information just as you would in discovery and see whether that's true or not. And another one you often hear is, okay, and this usually comes earlier uh, in the mediation where one side or the other says, they need to make a big move or we are done. We've been here already two hours and we've heard a lot, but really they're just nowhere near. Um, so there are other ways, other things you could address. There may be other parts of the deal. Okay, I understand that on the, on the money we're not getting there, but you know, you talked about a license. What would be licensed and how, how do you feel about that? And what would, you know, what kind of rates could, would we talk about that? Does it get the parties moving in a, in a, um, a mutually constructive direction? And maybe the money will come into play once they realize, oh, this is somebody I really can negotiate with. Uh, we probably can make a deal here. Uh, we've been doing it now for a few minutes. So that's the mediation uh, lamentations. Now let's assume in our next slide that we have uh, gotten by all of that and there's a deal. Great. Um, and everybody understands, they've been talking about, understand sort of the basics of the deal. Let me suggest to you, as I suggested in our last session briefly, but now let's get into a little more you really do want something in writing uh, that's sufficient to show what the settlement is and with enough detail uh, that it's going to be, probably going to be enforceable. Uh, at very least, you're going to want bullet points of agreed terms, usually signed by the parties. A lot of mediators use that as a default. And in IP cases, it might have to be followed by formal documents. but. Let me say that with a little planning, you probably can get quite a bit more detailed than that. And the mediator can also help you with that. Uh, when I'm settling these cases, you get that moment, oh, we have a settlement and we know the basic terms. And then I realize there's also going to be a negotiation about what that all means for a while. And having the mediator involved uh, to get that sorted out as much as possible before everybody goes home and says, well, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't have made that deal. Or was that really the deal? Or, you know, the, um, the um, common way to do this particular term is this, and they have something that's unacceptable to the other side. So the more you can get done, the better. Uh, it is possible in some cases with enough planning uh, that you could have a full settlement agreement with releases and license and everything. That's not completely likely. Uh, I've seen it happen though. And the more prepared you are when you go in uh, and if you've drafted some things ahead, that may actually happen uh, to avoid all the problems that happens when you had a, a pretty clear understanding of what the settlement was and it starts to fall apart over the details. So bring examples of language. Uh, you wanna be able to find products if that is defining what people can and can't do or what, they or what they're going to pay on, identify what's allowed, disallowed, 
Uh, if there's going to be a license agreement, you need to say what's licensed. Is it a patent? Is it you do it by products? Do you want some description? Those aren't things you can do on the fly. You want to be, uh, have thought through that all, but then be able to define as much of this in, as you can in as much uh, detail. And we've given you some other things here to think through. Uh, some people don't like releases. They want covenants not to sue. Okay, think that through if that's what you want and be able to explain why. Uh, if you're going to have uh, a license agreement, you know, there are licenses and there are licenses. You need to be able to find the rate and the base. Um, often you're going to need to have ways to uh, monitor compliance and, you know, you're going to have accountants go in every six months to make sure that they're really paying. Uh, if there are problems, who pays for all that uh, and so forth. So people often put in procedures for resolving drafting disputes. I've seen people make the mediator the arbitrator of what's going to be in the final settlement. I'm not sure I like that, uh, but a lot of lawyers, at least in my jurisdiction, suggest that, you know, be, think, through, think that through, be ready to address that. That's the kind of thing that's gonna happen in the end. I know I, oh, an awful lot of cases I've done have been through um, significant and expensive litigation, often in multiple forms. We've ended up, uh, having an ADR procedure. We arbitrate uh, if there's a problem with say a license agreement or other things that happen under the, uh, under the mediation agreement. Um, and of course, think through confidentiality provisions, uh, which are uh, typically part of these agreements and they aren't all the same. And it's something that, uh, again, you're probably going to want to address. So with that, I believe Harry has a, polling question for you. The polling question, and this relates to enforcing mediated settlements. <clears throat> the parties have reached a settlement they intend to memorialize in a formal agreement. For now, however, they would like to sign a term sheet on which the formal agreement will be based. For an enforceable agreement, which of these do the parties need? And this may sound like first semester contracts. The essential terms of the agreement, A, B, a meeting of the minds on the essential terms. C, the intent to be bound. D, the authority to settle. And E, all of the above. So we're gonna be talking in a minute about <clears throat> enforcing, uh, the enforcement of, of informal settlement agreements. That things like um, a term sheet. Okay, and look at that. All right, all of the above, 93%. <clears throat> That's what I would choose. Um, however, those, the folks that chose A and C and D were at least right in terms of those also being important because they're subsumed under E. <clears throat> so uh, when you read the cases about inform enforcing mediated settlement agreements, they're very interesting. Um, Many of them, I, I've never found a lot of them in the patent and technology field, but there are some. Um, and typically what the court is looking at facts, these are very fact intensive cases, and they're looking at, did the parties have, you know, identify the essential terms for an agreement? Was there a meeting of the minds on each of the terms? Did the parties intend to be bound by this informal document? Um, and was there authority to settle? Um, was there someone with full settlement authority present? Was there a situation where uh, the client had to leave early to catch a plane and the negotiations continue? The cases come up in the context often of, uh, in that, and there was a case just like with that situation where the, the client left the attorney and said, I have total faith in you. And then when the, when the, when the attorney, um, you know, went and, and decided something for, on behalf of the client, then he didn't. He was very upset with his, his attorney. Uh, sometimes these issues come up where parties get cold feet and, or at least one party gets cold feet and then tries to get out of the contract and the other side wants to enforce it. Or if, um, you know, in many cases, these, the um, settlement documents for patent technology uh, cases are not just a settlement agreement. It can be, but it can be assignments, licenses, combinations of those, other contractual arrangements. If it takes too long, sometimes a party 
can, if they don't trust the other side for whatever reason, they can just say, you know, I'm, I'm upset, I'm going to go to court and enforce what we have. Um, so that's the sense of um, what these cases are about. And really, I think is I would follow David's um, guidance in terms of, um, and, and what's outlined here, try to uh, work on getting the essential, identifying essential terms, showing that there was a meeting of the minds in terms of an agreement on what the essential term is, and indicating somewhere the intent to be bound, which is simply, oftentimes it could be just signing and dating. Um, sometimes, every once in a while, I don't see this often, um, parties will say we intend to be bound by you know, this agreement, but what we will be memorializing in formal documents, you know, the settlement, um, and, and every, I mean, you know, I, it's very rare that I've ever seen, but everybody may have a different experience, that parties will say we don't intend to be bound by this, these terms and conditions. Um, so that's a little bit about enforcing the mediated settlement. The Singapore Convention, Jan will talk about in just a little bit, but we have it here as a placeholder just to let you know that that's certainly part of, part of enforcing. Rod is next up. Okay, thank you, Harry. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, a catch-22. And this arises in the context of the strict confidentiality of mediation. We've mentioned this before, Confidentiality is one of the hallmarks of mediation. It's one of the real core principles that make mediation work. But there's a catch-22 when it comes to enforcing an agreement. If an agreement is reached during a mediation, how do you go about enforcing it? If there's a disagreement later on about whether or not there is an agreement or what the agreement really is. So here's the scenario. Um, it's a situation where there's a document, a term sheet as, as Harry and, and David described, arrived at the mediation. So it's a document created during the mediation. Um, and some statutes, including California, will say that anything said or done or created in a mediation, any writing created in a mediation is confidential and is inadmissible for any other purpose. So there are cases in California with the, hitting this uh, catch-22 where there's a mediated settlement agreement, then a disagreement, one party tries to enforce it, and the court says, sorry, no can do. The evidence code says that anything said or done in a mediation is inadmissible for any other purpose, full stop. So here is the way out, and this is the, the magic words that are referred to in this slide. The evidence code in California recognizes that if the parties recite in the term sheet or the short form agreement, words to the effect that they intend this to be a binding and admissible settlement agreement, then that will get that document admissible later on if you need to enforce it. But if you leave that out, there's some very real and dire consequences potentially. So let me talk a little bit more um, First of all, here, the citations are on this slide to the evidence code as well as to the Code of Civil Procedure. Other states have similar laws, but I'm not sure all of them is, are as strict and unforgiving as California's. But whatever jurisdiction you're in, know what the law is governing the confidentiality of mediation agreements. Let's shift to the next slide and talk about a trap for the unwary here. And I'm gonna spend a little time on this decision. Um, it's the flat panel antitrust case. It's a published decision from the Ninth Circuit. You can see the site there at 835 Fed 3rd 1155. And here's where I wanna spend some time on it. It's a situation where it's a tech case, it's antitrust, but it's all about flat panel displays. And we have very, very skilled counsel. It's an MDL case, so there are many, many underlying cases below it. You have very good counsel on both sides and you have a very skilled mediator. So in one case, the very skilled mediator was hired. They went through the mediation session. They did everything, let's assume they did everything right that we've been talking about for the last uh, two parts now, but they were unable to reach a resolution during the mediation session. The mediator tried and tried, but they were just too far apart. So they adjourned the session with the understanding that the mediator would think about what would be a possible resolution. 
And here the mediator dismissed the parties, but said, I'm going to send you an email with a proposal, a mediator's proposal. And this is a technique that I'll spend a little time describing because it comes up a lot these days where the mediator comes up with a proposal for a resolution. It's not what the mediator thinks is the right resolution or the legally correct lit resolution. It's the resolution that the mediator thinks is most likely to be acceptable to both sides. It's most likely to, to do it, to get a deal done. So here in the flat panel case, the mediator sent an email to the parties and said, here is my proposal. It's mediator's proposal. And this is all, by the way, reproduced in the Ninth Circuit opinion, makes an interesting reading with all the names of the folks involved. But the, the skilled mediator said, you know, this is my, my proposal and I want you both to understand. Your response back to me is gonna be yes or no. That's all I wanna hear. If we end up with two yeses, we'll have a, a settlement. If we have a no or two no's, there'll be no settlement. And if there's no settlement, all I'm gonna tell you is there's no settlement. So if we have a situation with a yes and a no, the no party of course knows there's no settlement, but the yes party uh, doesn't know necessarily what the other side, well, I got the background. The, the, the uh, party that says no doesn't necessarily know what the other side said because they just know there's no settlement. So there is not a, re a revealing of that yes, if there is a yes or a no from the other side. It's what the mediator described, a double blind process. So the idea is if there's not gonna be a settlement, the party that says yes won't necessarily lose a negotiating advantage. That's what the mediator's proposal is about. We could spend a lot of time talking about that. I have my own criticisms of it. I think it's overused these days. But in any event, it was used here, in the flat panel case, and there were two yeses. So the mediator responds back, you have an agreement. Congratulations. They go off. A couple of weeks later, the party that had agreed to pay several million dollars has a change of heart, doesn't want to pay, doesn't make the payment. So the party who was going to receive the payment goes to court to try to enforce the agreement. They bring a suit in diversity, but they want to get to the same judge who had the case originally. So they do that here in the Northern District of California. But under diversity jurisdiction, they try to enforce the contract. Let's assume that term sheet, the mediator's proposal, has all the essential terms from that slide question we just asked, uh, the polling question we just asked a moment ago. But it doesn't say the parties agree that this email can be admissible. Nothing about admissibility. So the district court judge looks at it and says, sorry, no can, no can do, we can't enforce this. The California law governs here and it's not admissible. I can't enforce it, full stop. One side takes an appeal, the losing side. They go up to the Ninth Circuit and this is what spawned the decision that you have the site to. The Ninth Circuit reversed and the disappointed party gets a lifeline because the Ninth Circuit looks at it and says, well, wait a second. The underlying dispute was a mixed federal question and diversity case. So there was both state law claims as well as federal question claims, antitrust claims. Because of that, because the underlying dispute had a federal question, we looked to federal common law for the admissibility of this document and the enforceability of this document. And under federal common law, we will enforce the settlement agreement. And there's a happy ending for the party that agreed to uh, the settlement. So, you know, the, the, the takeaway on this trap for the unwary is always, always, always put the magic words in your term sheet, in your final agreement and anything else. It can't hurt to say the parties agree that it's final and binding and admissible. And it may necessarily save you if you get into this situation. Let me um, add one more site for you. This is not on a slide, so you might wanna jot this down. Here's a very recent case um, called Larson versus Larson. It's a 10th circuit case from February. And it's not published, but it is in the appendix, 687 Fed Appendix 695. And I want to take a moment or two more on this one because it illustrates how you need to understand what law governs. That case was a family dispute, a big fight over 
uh, business, a lot of business assets. And that's why it's the same name, Larson versus Larson. It was a brother and sister type dispute. It happened in Colorado. That's where the underlying litigation was. They went to a mediation and to try to resolve things. And uh, they all agreed Colorado law applied to the mediation. They even had a uh, agreement, a confidentiality agreement that said everything said in the mediation is confidential and Colorado evidence code applies and they all signed off on that. They reached an agreement. Months later, there was a disagreement. The, the, the family got into another fight about what did that underlying agreement mean? In particular, was there a ranch covered by this agreement or not? But the ranch was in Wyoming. So the party who thought the ranch was covered sued in Wyoming and they invoked diversity jurisdiction and they ended up getting an appellate decision as I gave, just gave you the site where the appellate court said, this is now the 10th circuit. The appellate court said, look, there's a direct conflict here between Colorado law, which is like California, that says if the agreement is not admissible, it can't be enforced versus Wyoming law, which actually has a statute saying that if there's an agreement in mediation, you can indeed use what happened in the mediation to enforce the agreement. There's a direct conflict here. So even though the parties agreed that Colorado law governed, because there was a direct conflict under, under Wyoming law, under its conflict of law principles, and I'm gonna read this a little bit, because the Colorado law was contrary to law, public policy, or general interests of Wyoming citizens, the district court applied Wyoming law and allowed a key piece of evidence to come in. The key piece of evidence was a PowerPoint presentation made by one of the lawyers in the mediation that apparently said, this ranch is covered. And they got that piece of evidence in a PowerPoint presentation, much like what you're looking at now, because of Wyoming law said it comes in, whereas Colorado law said it didn't. So, that's the latest on confidentiality. And the takeaway I think is mediation has strong, strong, strong confidentiality, but it's not ironclad. Know what law applies and watch for these traps for the unwary. Make sure you use it, recite the magic words in your agreement. And I think we're ready for the next slide. Okay, thank you, Rod. Uh, so now we're going to add another layer of complexity. Uh, the Singapore Convention, uh, which was signed last year, is uh, in full name, the UN Convention on International Settlement Agreements Resulting from Mediation. The goal of the Singapore Convention was really to promote the use of mediation and make it a legitimate and credible process alternative to international arbitration. Uh, international arbitration has the New York Convention, for purposes of enforcement. So this was uh, considered in a parallel to distinguish but be its own enforcement mechanism. Um, so it obliges the contracting states to recognize settlement agreements from mediation. It will enter, it was signed and ratified uh, adequate to enter into force this September. So about a month, September 12th. Uh, you may think uh, that may or may not apply in your particular circumstance, but be very careful um, because it, uh, don't assume it doesn't apply. It may. And you may want to think about how to complete the requirement uh, that a mediation mediator confirms the mediation agreement. And that is going to vary by jurisdiction. Also anticipate uh, the grounds, either from your side or from the other side, how you might challenge or refuse enforcement if it were brought to bear. So Singapore Convention, new law, new uh, uh, factor to include in the settlement agreement. Uh, it makes sure you ensure uh, that the parties are on the same page uh, about the mediation process generally and the specifics of enforcement. Uh, talk about uh, this with your client and the other side. Uh, make sure there's no misunderstanding 
uh, certainly cross-culturally, cross-border in terms of the parties and the intentions. Whether a translator is required for signing the mediation settlement agreement and how that might affect the process. And uh, again, uh, full settlement authority by the parties signing and whether any remote communication is necessary. So uh, there is a question whether we're negotiating uh, or mediating on Zoom, thinking about where, where are we? We've got parties uh, all over the world and what is the, uh, the jurisdiction in covering the process. So just some of the new issues to add to your checklist of important things to confirm with your client, with the party on the other side uh, for completion and enforcement. So uh, Harry, I think you're going to give us some overview uh, on uh, books some resources. and resources. Yep. So we have some resources here to share with you. Um, some of them are on the slide and I'll tell you about some others. The first is the Sedona Conference Commentary on Patent Litigation Best Practices. There's a patent mediation chapter that's excellent. And Rod Thompson, one of our presenters today, is a co-editor of that chapter. So take a look at that. Um, we have some books. Uh, one book is uh, by David Allgaier one of our presenters, and it's in the arbitration arena, Arbitrating Patent Disputes, A Practical Guide. Um, another book is ADR Advocacy Tr Strategies and Practices for Intellectual Property and Technology Cases. I'm the editor and an author um, of that book. Um, in my book, I have quite a few chapters about mediation. There's a chapter from uh, written by Magistrate Judge Thine the District of Delaware, who's done quite a few patent cases um, over the years, and she does them all the time. There's a chapter from an in-house counsel, that perspective of mediation from advocates, and there's a chapter on mediation before the International Trade Commission in ITC investigations, as well as a chapter of mediation before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. If you, uh, you can see that those books are published by ABA's intellectual property law section. Um, and if you're interested, you can get online, um, go to the ABA IPL sections under books. And if you order before um, August 31st of this month and use that code, you'll get a 30% discount. And you'll get, a, um, you'll get a copy of the slides, so you'll be able to have all that information. Two other references I want to mention are um, anybody that attends the, um, this session today or the other day will get a chapter from my book um, or an early case assessment. I went into that in uh, at least in summary form last time um, and it was really relating to the use of early case assessment as a tool for getting prepared for mediation. So you may find that helpful. And then there's a uh, article um, by Rod Thompson and it's called Exploring and Using Business Solutions in Mediation Settlement Agreements. It was published in CPR has a newsletter. CPR is the International uh, Conf pardon me, Conflict and Prevention, International Conflict and Prevention. Um, and it is based in New York and they have a, a great newsletter called The Alternatives. And this article by Rod was published in April of this year. Um, so those are some things that you will receive from attending the, uh, the session today. Now we're gonna go ahead to, David's gonna lead us through some questions uh, that you have for us. Okay, thank you, Harry. Um, we have quite a few questions, uh, good questions. And let's take a shot at them. Uh, and I do appreciate uh, folks that have asked questions. If you do have uh, further questions, please type them out and we'll try and take those up as well. But let's start with the first one, uh, which I'm happy to take a crack at and then let the others on our panel uh, look at it as well. And here's the question. Do you find anything in patent tech, ca tech cases that makes the joint session question different from other types of disputes? Uh, I can start with that and say, maybe. Um, depending on the type of dispute. Um, what I find, uh, particularly in, uh, in patent cases, is if your decision maker 
client uh, on either side is not a technical person, and they're not going to be a patent lawyer typically, and may well not even be a scientist, they probably don't really understand the claim construction issues or infringement issues or invalidity issues the same way that the lawyers do. And it seems to me that if, the, if it was done right, and I've seen it done right, that would be, much as in the example that Rod gave us earlier, a polite way of uh, cluing everybody in the business types that there really is a dispute here and it really could go either way, uh, or at least the other side's arguments might have something to them. Typically, the executive's just going to be say, well, I, you know, I talked to my patent lawyer who explains these things to me and sort of as a matter of science, I'm right and they're wrong. That's what I know. Uh, but it might be quite useful to go through that exercise. Rod, do you agree with that or what do you think? I do, Dave, and just to put a little more gloss on it, um, you know, there's nothing to be more persuasive, I think, to a GC, maybe a non-technical GC, to try to understand a patent claim construction issue and have it presented in a way that really emphasizes complexity and then presented with the obvious, this is what a jury is going to have to decide. I mean, is that, do you really want to put this issue before a jury? Um, you know, if you can't understand it, you're a smart guy and you get confused and you know that your company, uh, a jury is really gonna get confused. Dave, the other way that I think it could also be helpful is when there's a, a very technical issue and you wanna have your um, technical people there, maybe on both sides. So they, they can try to make sure that they really understand the technology in question. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, sometimes they're just fundamental disagreements. Sometimes there's something lost by the advocates and you wanna have the engineers speaking directly to each other in the same room. Now, I would say that, to pick up on what you said earlier, to make that happen, in many jurisdictions, uh, you almost have to overcome uh, often what the advocates want to do. And I'm not saying the mediator necessarily needs to overcome it, but sometimes a little persuasion is necessary on one side or the other, or the mediator to say, yeah, I know you've probably had problems with joint sessions, everybody just got mad and they heard uh, opening and closing statements and it took me as the mediator a couple hours to settle everybody down uh, or the other mediator took that long. But this one, it might, if we approach this right, there might be some real value in having, uh, having some understanding of what's going on here. But, uh, but I think you, you probably have to fight a little bit to do it because joint sessions for whatever reason just aren't in the kind of favor they once were. I think that's right. And also by the same token, it might be coming from the advocate who, you know, this, a good trial lawyer will understand this case should settle. And I, if I'm going to settle, I'm going to need to have a joint session and I'm going to talk to the mediator about arranging for it. Yeah. And, and if they approach that with a mediation mindset, remembering what they're really trying to do is uh, convince the other side, uh, that might work pretty well. Okay. Any other thoughts from the panel on that one? All right. Uh, Here's another uh, question, uh, and here's the question. Assuming the mediation occurs by video, how effective could an opening statement be? PowerPoint that could be immediately shared with the other side might be prudent. Uh, what does anyone think about that? So now we're moving on sort of thinking about a virtual me uh, mediation. Yeah, I'll just jump in. The the. Uh, a Zoom mediation is a challenge for all participants. Um, you know, we're looking at the camera. You don't, you're not looking in someone's eyes. You're not making eye contact. You're not getting the, the nonverbal um, reactions. So if you're making an opening statement, you really can't tell if you're getting through um, because you're, you know, there's no feedback from, from reliable feedback. On the other hand, um, it also is a little more distant. So you're not as likely, I think, to come on too strong and be real insulting because people are, are on the other side of the table from you. So it, I, I think it, I don't know if it's less effective necessarily, but all of mediation is more challenging uh, in the Zoom format. I do think that if you're gonna do it, uh, sharing a PowerPoint probably in advance is helpful um, because just sharing your screen 
the other side may may want to go back and look at what you're what you're providing. So you could do it before or after, but make sure that they get a copy. Well, I can note there's one sort of silver lining in the uh, mediation cloud, if, if I can uh, by Zoom, if I can call it that. Um, people are probably less reluctant to have a joint session when they're not actually in the same room and are just on the same screen. At least I I saw that in the case I had. There were about 12 different parties involved in the case. And uh, I, I'd never had such a congenial joint session, mostly because they're just all on TV and they just weren't that concerned about the whole thing. Uh, and actually I found that was kind of uh, a useful thing about online. Some of the uh, concerns that people have are just a little bit less because you're a little more distant. That has its own problems, uh, but it's a little opportunity that way too. All right. Um, Dave, before you leave the Zoom issue, just one one further note is I've seen it's seen written about um, the confidentiality issue that I, I mentioned earlier about the choice of law. Um, it's one thing when you have an in-person session and everyone's in Colorado, Denver in that case, but if it's by Zoom and you have people all around the country or even all around the world, uh, what law does govern that? And that's, you know, it, it adds another layer of complexity to that whole issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, next question. Um, on the term sheet, even if all criteria are met, but it is entitled an MOU or Memorandum of Understanding, does that make the term sheet not enforceable? Any thoughts on that from the panel? I would say, I mean, it's up to, it's, again, it's going to be up to the district court or a court to decide, probably not a district court, but it will be a state court. All the cases that I read, unless there's, a, you know, diversity of jurisdiction, um, they were, many of these were in state court. Uh, what, you know, what the court is looking at is, is, is the, are the criteria met? Um, and if the person who's trying to enforce the agreement is enforcing it as a done deal, as a, you know, a, a, a forcible agreement, um, and the evidence shows that the essential terms are embodied in the, uh, on the agreement, that there was a meeting of the minds, that the parties intended to be bound, I don't think that the, the mere nomenclature that's used at the top is going to make, you know, may make a difference. Um, it really depends upon the evidence. And interestingly, in these cases, the court's looking at things like email exchanges, they're looking at um, uh, text messages, they're looking at things like if you left a recording for somebody, you left a message and, and the recording was transcribed, they're looking at all kinds of things. Some of these cases are also, um, they're relevant because when you're trying to enforce it, it gets to some of the things that Rob was talking about. Do the, like with the media's proposal, does what happens at the mediation get in? And depending upon the law applied, that's, you know, that's uh, other issues. But I, I really do think that when, I, when I've read these cases, uh, that's what they're, they're looking at, not necessarily just what it was, um, you know, just what the nomenclature or what it was, what the title of it was. They're looking at a lot more. And of course, with these cases being fact intensive, there's also, um, you know, people testifying under oath. And, and so that's another part of it. I might uh, add to that, uh, in my experience, uh, courts like settlements. Uh, they just do. Um, and I think if the court is convinced that there really was a genuine settlement and, and so forth and so on, you know, there are many courts inclination is to be, well, there was a settlement and yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to enforce it if I can, but we should do all we can to uh, make sure we uh, put the, the things in there that will help the court uh, see that legally, yeah, it's something that has to be recognizable. Okay, uh, the next uh, question is, to date, only four countries have ratified the Singapore Convention till such date as more countries yeah. ratify the convention. How would you look at enforceability, uh, enforceability of international settlement agreements? Well, 
I would call, uh, well, uh, thank you for raising the question. Um, it turns out, uh, at least according to the Ancestral uh, website, that only uh, three ratifications were required. So six months after that third ratification is September. So it will enter into force next month. But I thought perhaps uh, maybe uh, my colleagues on the panel could speak to what kind of enforcement uh, was practiced uh, cross-border before we had Singapore. So let me suggest that I haven't done this myself, but I've heard uh, a recommendation that if you do want to have a enforceable cross-border agreement, you could consider turning your mediation into an arbitration and having right. the mediator wear an arbitrator hat and right. issue an arbitration award, which then could be enforced under the New York Convention. Right. Yeah, I have heard, in fact, the Singapore Center for Mediation Arbitration has a process called ARB Med ARB, uh, so that you initiate an arbitration proceeding, switch over to mediation, get a settlement, and then go back to mediation and have that entered as a, an enforceable uh, conclusion under the New York Convention. So there have been a lot of clever um, approaches to the question. Uh, in an earlier session, we promised we would answer some of the questions from the earlier session, and let me get to one of them, and here's what it is. Uh, in a global settlement, do you suggest that there be multiple mediation counsel at the table to ensure that jurisdictional issues are addressed? If not, how do you take into account regulatory and compliance issue in the settlement agreement while avoiding uh, regret by the parties? Harry, did you have some thoughts on that one? Yeah, I do. Um, certainly, I, I've had that experience, and um, it can come up in different ways. So, for example, in advance of the mediation, <clears throat> one party may say, well, this is some of the options we have, and it may, um, let's say, in the regulatory area, in pharmaceuticals, it may um, imply uh, antitrust issues. Well, I may go to the mediation having talked to antitrust counsel in advance <clears throat> so that I know if I'm going to put that on the table that that's something at least I have some sense of. Um, another way of doing it is um, in terms of having them, at, you know, having somebody at the table. You don't necessarily have to do that, though. That's one way of doing it. Um, another thing is if you want to float the idea by another side, float the idea, some options by, you know, your opposing counsel. And one of them implicates um, you know, certain issues. Like I said, I'll give an example of antitrust. Well, both of you may have you know, your counsel separately, I've done this before, separately research the issue, and then you can come back and see what you find out. So it can help to um, you know, formulate what the settlement is gonna be. Typically when there are issues, having people at the table that are knowledgeable um, certainly is helpful if you're not gonna do it before. But there are times when you may be able to get the framework of a deal down and then you need to, both parties need to say, okay, we're gonna stop here today and we're going to take this back, you know, talk to counsel, take this back to higher ups at the company and then get together again. And the mediator can orchestrate that to move things along. So it may be by talking to people before, having counsel present or, taking a break and, and getting the expert advice that you need to, um, to, to you know, prepare the requisite documents. Another, another, by the way, another thing along these lines that I, I've seen quite often is, uh, again, in a patent dispute, uh, you may well have, in parallel with the litigation going, a re-exam or something like that going, uh, or maybe there's an inter-parties review about to happen or whatever, it's really pretty important uh, for say patent litigators to also have people who are, if they're, if they're not uh, as skilled in uh, the patent office practice and those issues to have somebody like that available uh, to be able to talk to them um, and get all that, all that sort of thing straight uh, if you really wanna get a, a settlement done. And you know, you'll know that that's the case uh, and certainly at least have those people on call. Uh, so they'll immediately answer calls and, uh, and you probably have gone over some of that with them ahead of time. Okay, uh, next question, a good one since we've talked about this quite a bit. 
how do you lower the emotional temperature? For example, the defendant might be insulted in being accused of infringement by a ridiculously obvious patent and vice versa. How do you handle that when that comes up during one of your mediations? And, and I will say to e echo this question, you may think that um, tech mediation is sort of bloodless and scientific because you're talking about patents or trade secrets or technology. I can assure you it's just the opposite. Uh, I think some of the most heated disputes I've ever seen uh, tend to involve uh, intellectual property, patents, and particularly trade secrets. So uh, you're, there's likely to be a lot of emotion involved. So my reaction is this, in any mediation, first of all, you probably want to get, get people out of joint session if they're in a joint session. Um, it's not going to take the temperature down to, to leave folks uh, in the same room, but get them in the caucus and then let, let the venting come out. Let, let the, if the defendant is insulted, let the defendant tell you about it. Let the defendant put some of that emotion out there and then gradually bring, it, bring him or her down and explain this is ultimately a business dispute. It has to be resolved. It's something you really want to get rid of. Um, and it's, you know, try not to take it personally. Um, but I think, you know, uh, Dave, I agree with you 100%. You know, tech cases and patent cases are every bit as emotionally driven, personality driven as any other. And what I would say I would add to that is, um, as since we're talking about advocacy in these kinds of cases, I would hope that the advocate realizes that, um, picks this up in, the, in their, their client and doesn't just dismiss it. So that meaning that in before the mediation, I'm, I'm gonna look at before, I agree with what my colleagues have said, but even before the mediation, hopefully there might be, I mean, some indication in the, if there's an exchanged brief, um, you know, something goes from one side to the other and this comes out. Um, and certainly a mediator, I usually typically propound a number of questions that I want my, the parties to respond in ex parte briefing, and hopefully this would, you know, this would be snuffed out then, so that we realize that this could be something that this is a feeling that the person has and why. My feeling would be to try to turn the emotion that the party has into something that's more concrete. So if you think it's a ridiculous, it's obvious patent, what is your, you know, let's see what your prior art is about. <clears throat> give that to the other side so that the other side can digest that. And then I, as a mediator, could use that to do reality testing with the other side and, and really try to have the other side focus on um, what the, you know, the merits of it. And, and that may bring, tr to try to take emotion and to try to um, bring it down because you're then changing it into something that is concrete. Um, that might be another way of, of handling it. And um, if there are issues that, you know, are there, um, then, then go to Rod and David's advice during the course of the mediation. Okay. Uh, question. What is your opinion on whether the mediator should or should not advise counsel who is unaware about the binding and admissible language required in California law for their settlement agreement? Do you just kind of say, well, that's too bad. You should have had a better lawyer. Uh, I'm not going to put my finger on the scale. Or does the mediator, uh, is it sensible for the mediator to say, look, you, if you want this thing to stick, you're going to have to put this language in there. So my, my, own, my own practice, hopefully it's the right practice, um, is to uh, make sure that the parties are aware of that issue. I have a, a short form agreement it's a one pager that has a lot of blanks, but it has the binding and admissible language in there. Uh, and I just provide it to counsel for both sides when the time comes. Uh, I don't want to draft anything else in the settlement agreement itself. That's, that's, that's for them. I'm not practicing law for them, but it, I think it is in everyone's interest to end up with a binding and enforceable agreement. So just having that language in there seems like the prudent thing to do. You don't want to, you don't want to, leave the parties open to a challenge. I would echo that in, in under Minnesota law, there's a different uh, set of things. There's a statute that actually says that the parties have to be advised of this, that, and the other thing, that the mediator doesn't represent them. 
uh, that is not looking out for their legal interests and there are a number of things the parties need to be advised of uh, with reference to a Minnesota statute. Yeah, I always make sure I include that. I, I have a little sort of blank form settlement agreement just to get everyone thinking about that because uh, I like people to think about that ahead of time if you hadn't noticed. And uh, I do about the same thing with that. I think we have run out of time if I'm not incorrect about that. Um, is there anything on any of these topics or anything else anyone's dying to say right now? No, I think that uh, not for me. <laughs> okay, well, with that, thank you all very much. I wanna especially thank my panelists, uh, Bill from uh, the Silicon Valley Arbitration Mediation Center and everyone who put this together. And of course, most of all, all the folks who've uh, attended this with us and thank you and uh, hope to see you all again. Thank you. Thanks.